Hi, Susan. Welcome to the show. Hey, Sherry. I'm super glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And I'm excited to be in front of your listeners. Oh, I'm so excited to have this conversation today, too. This is going to be a very special one. I think I think this is the one that most people are going to want to listen to because I have a feeling we're going to dive into some deep truths and you're going to be sharing with us some things that you've you've written in your memoir, you've written in your book, things that you help people overcome. And I think what's really important is today we're going to be addressing how our traumas, our past experiences are continuing to show up for us and continuing to create the life that we are currently experiencing, even when, when we are in that place of massive change. And many of us are hiring coaches or really investing in a lot of courses and, and self-development de to help transform their lives, but never addressing these past anchors that are keeping us where we are, I think is, is where the work is always at. And so I appreciate your time so much here today, Susan. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Welcome to the show. Wow. And what a format and what a formula you've created for really creating personal and open dialogue in some touchy areas. Because believe me, I ran, literally ran <laughs> for years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I've, I've been doing what I'm doing for over 22 years now. I, I keep saying 22 years, but I should probably actually go back and check, but I've been doing this for what I've been doing for, for so long. And when I first started my journey as a fitness coach, I was a personal trainer and it was all about diet and exercise. You know, that is the formula to give you the results that you want. And then it just became very obvious to me that there was something missing, something massively broken several years in where I would share what I thought was the best meal plan and the best workout program. And I would still see my clients struggling and not being able to really pinpoint what it was until I realized that I'm not working with a person who just has a goal. I'm working with a whole person. I'm working with an entire being who's gone through many, many experiences in their lives, many experiences in their upbringing. And that's actually the block. The block is the obstacle. The block is the limiting belief. It's it's our self image. It's who we think we are. It's it's our view and perspective of the world. And once we un uncover that and we really understand that this is how I have been living my life based on these rules, on these principles, on my self image and working through that, working through the emotions, working through the trauma is the byproduct of that inner work. And once we do that, we start to experience levels of health and fitness like we've never seen before. And fitness and health just becomes a part of who we are and not a means to try to punish ourselves for wanting to look a certain way, but instead it really becomes our oxygen. Wow, you said it. I need to like have that as an audio recording <laughs> and use it going forward. That's it for sure. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about your story, Susan. I know, I know when we, before we started re recording, we said, okay, there's going to be massive truth bombs here. And so I'm all in just to let you know, I'm also all in. Um, and I want to learn a little bit more about your story and share with the audience. First of all, what brought you to this place? Why do you do the work that you do today? Well, it started in my upbringing and I just pieced together a memoir that was published last, um, last month. It's called toxic family transforming childhood trauma into adult freedom. And that is where it started. I was the middle kid of five with two pseudo adults at the helm. My father's a brilliant astrophysicist. He's also an alcoholic in my opinion and was an exercise bulimic. So I had that behavior demonstrated in the masculine. And in the feminine, I had my mother who was horribly abused as a child. It's in the lineage. And she was a compulsive overeater on diet pills, AKA speed. Mm. And I believe also she may have had a mental health issue. So these were the two lead vehicles and you can imagine the insanity and there were inappropriate boundaries and abuse of every form slathered over every crevice. I think I shared with you, my mom used to eat out of the grocery bags coming out of the store into getting into the car. And I would want to shield myself behind the layers of flesh on her body that she kept to feel safe. She was living with a Peter Pan. 
an absolute predator who was full on cheating practically since the honeymoon and was saddled with five kids before she was 30 years old. Mm. Wow. That's intense. And I, I just want to give space for just a moment just to to sit in what you just shared, because I felt so much emotion coming off of you as, as you're sharing that. And I feel that even when we've done the work to be where you are today, reliving it through just conversation and experience is something that we will continuously have to do. And so I appreciate and honor so much that you've shared this with us. And I'm just curious around when, when you started to have awareness that something was wrong. As a child, we're growing up in this environment that's almost our normal. We don't know anything else. We don't know what we don't know. We're, you know, this is my mom, this is my dad. I don't choose my parents. I don't choose this, these circumstances. When did you realize that there was something off? And, and I think you called it a toxic family. When did you realize that this is a toxic environment? Well, if any of your listeners have little ones around with you, you may want to step in the other room for this. I'll go back to as early as four, and I could actually go back earlier, but we were all getting baths. It was bath time. There were five children. My mother was taking us one by one. The bath water was like halfway down in the tub, gray, but I was excited. It was going to be my turn. You know, I was going to get in and I was getting all squappity and squishy and happy. And my mother's personality shifted. And she grabbed my arm and her thumb went piercing through my little bone. And she started to shake me. And she said, why are you so bad? Why won't you behave? And then she started to beat me, Sherry. And the room went brown and I saw stars and I got hot. And all I could think of was, I'm a bad girl. What did I do to make my mommy so angry with me? I'm not safe. Hmm. That's that's harsh for for such a small child and especially when there's no there's no explanation and at that time of our development we actually cannot rationalize between our experience or or our actions and the consequences of those actions. And so I would imagine that that this was was likely something that you experienced frequently and and likely also observed your siblings experience this. And so what was that environment like for for your siblings as well? Was there also that awareness that that there's something not right? So it's odd. Um, there's three boys and a girl and we all have a very different experience of what happened in that home. Each of us, my oldest brother, who I have the most abuse with in between, his childhood is blacked out. It's like amnesia took over because it was so traumatic. And the difficult thing was our mother could be so loving and kind and nurturing. And then the next moment you're getting beaten six ways to Sunday and you have no idea what happened and why. So it just came out of nowhere in huge heaps. And that was an unsteady platform. And my dad with this drinking had clearly mixed up boundaries. Mm. And I will also share that he oogled me like I was a piece of meat. And when I turned a teen, it was too painful for him to handle and he rejected me like I was a dirty tissue. And that followed me into my adulthood. And it really toyed with my sense of being and my self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. And so I, I feel like you have you have this vulnerability and this this openness to share the story. And I'm curious when that when that started. Were you always open to sharing what happened or is this something that kind of came with a, an aha moment for you? So I saw the red flags act out in my own adult life, mm -hmm. similar to what had happened in my family. And I knew something was wrong and I was able to get help. And I've gotten help along the way. I think somatic forms of therapy have really helped me the most more than talk 
modes of therapy. Although that has helped too, it was important for me to reconstruct the story and to understand my story and where I came from. But having done decades of work, I now see the incredible role my parents played, my brothers played, my sister played, how fortunate I have been to be born into that family, to experience what I had and to look at it head on. Wow. That's powerful. That is so, so powerful. And it's, it's interesting because what I, what I hear you say is life happened for me, not to me. And what I hear you say is I choose not to be the victim. Do you think that we can transform from a place where we feel that we are the victim of our circumstances? I absolutely do. And I've done it repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I believe we can is because I believe we're here for an experience, that this is an incredible school of learning, not pretty. And sometimes I think this planet is like the straight up ghetto of the solar system. It's nasty. <laughs> but I have to tell you, as far as like chances and opportunities for soul evolution, this is it. And I've embraced it. I think maybe next time I'll check the fine print of the agreement. <laughs> or I come back and I say yes. Right. Right. Yeah, that's so powerful. I'm I'm super curious sometimes because I actually feel, and just, just hearing your sh your story, is that you took your power back, right? There, there's this part of us that, that understands all of these things happened and they were traumatic and they were painful and they were uncomfortable and I went through it. And then to really get in that place where you're almost owning that power has to almost be a decision where you decide to not be the victim because as the victim, and maybe I'm wrong, Susan, and maybe I have a different perspective, which I'm super curious about, but as, as a victim, I'm powerless in, my, in the control of the situation, right? I don't actually have that capacity to, to change the situation. The situation of course being, who who I decide I want to be after all those things happen to me, how I decide I want to treat others after all those things happen to me, right? But constantly feeling like it's not my fault that happened to me and why me and when, you know, why did that have to be my life and why, 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 I feel is almost a disempowering place and it's difficult to make a change when we're not when we're not in that place of this happened for me, I'm so grateful for all these things. And now I also choose that I will take what happened to impact others, to maybe help others who are struggling through that same thing. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I do believe that we have our moment to sit yeah. in, that, in that pot and sort of resonate in the poor me's. I think there's merit in that, but you have to stand up. Right. from that pot and somehow wade through and walk up and out mm -hmm. because otherwise you're living a trajectory that does not belong to you. That's mm -hmm. eating the rat poison and expecting that perpetrator to drop over. No, no, you're going to drop over. I didn't want to drop over. I'd already been beaten down enough <laughs> to just stand up and that light was in me since I was wee little mm. and I never lost it. I never lost sight of it. Oh, so beautiful. I love that so much. So what was, the, what was the worst out of, out of anything that you remember from your childhood? What was, what was the worst experience that comes to mind? Well, I, I want to say that there were really nasty times and delightful times in childhood, but the worst for me was coming full circle in adulthood and really believing I had created a family of choice and beauty, that I had the partner of my dreams, and I was becoming more exhausted in the relationship from carrying the weight. Mm. And ultimately, this man's mask fell. And he landed in the master bedroom of a home I bought and paid for and maintained for our family. And I landed on a mattress on the floor in a partial conversion in the garage. 
And that's the billboard it took to fall on my head, to wake me up to my power and step into it. I was told over and over, you're so accomplished. You're so successful. You're so independent. You're so powerful. But I didn't feel that. Mm -hmm. I was still trying to win over my dad's love, my mom's love, and to stand up and be recognized with achieving, achieving, achieving. And I had to be knocked down hard to surrender. And that man, he's my greatest guru, Sherry. Absolutely. I give him total credit. Mm, That's powerful. Are you still with that person today? No, we said goodbye. I wrote him a six figure check and off he went to repeat the patterning. But it's, it's really a miraculous healing for me because it was like everything coming together. It took my experience meditating. I would go on silent meditation retreats for a week long, no contact, no speaking. And that's what it took in that circumstance, a year of that to disengage and to stand up. And I hear so many stories that women can't extricate some men can't extricate from those types of relationships Mm -hmm. but my ability as an endurance athlete came in too it was a day at a time I went into training I used that little garage room as a monastery Mm -hmm. and I said this is the universe doing for me what I cannot do for myself and that was to be a strong, independent, grounded woman, and to find authentic love that came from inside, not outside, from another human being, or another accolade, another triathlon I won, or a marathon, or becoming a kettlebell princess, or, you know, standing up longer in the hot yoga room than anybody else did, like silliness. Oh, wow. 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 So powerful. And so, so much to unpack here. And it's amazing how retraction and just coming back to ourself in that moment of silence gives us all the answers and everything we're searching for is already within us. And we're so plugged into the world. We're so plugged into what's going on. We're so attached to everything around us. We're in a constant state of reaction that we don't actually take the time to silence ourselves and really reconnect with who we truly are. Because who we truly are is not the life that we're living and it's not that childhood that we have. Like who we truly are shows up when we have that place of silence, when we are with ourselves. And it seems like those silent retreats really brought that part of you where there's almost a remembrance of who you are. And I think only from this place can we truly act in such a loving way. Otherwise, it's what everyone else wants to do. Otherwise, it's what society wants to do or what was expected of us from our parents or the same trap that we've been stuck in because of all the things that happened to us in our childhood. And so I I cannot, I wow, I cannot resonate more enough with what you just shared. And it was just so, so powerful. And so I think you use that trauma ultimately to to find your power. And so what does that look like now for you? What was life like before when you were, more of a victim of your circumstances just in that place and then what did it transform into once you took back your power well i think it's a lifetime process i don't think i push that button and i'm 200 percent. nor do i want to portray that to my clients or your listeners i'm a human being going through this process one pants leg at a time and sometimes it's harder than others um But I will say that I raised my son independently. He's 19 and he's working his way through college in three years instead of four. And I'm so proud of him. I turned that garage that had been full of DVDs and tapes and posters and vinyl records into an income suite and paid half my mortgage and my taxes and my insurance. And I was able to keep hold of that home 
And then I sold that home and I moved to rural bliss. I lived in New York City and I lived in Los Angeles and I loved my time there and I loved the experience. But to have this open sky and the serenity and the clarity of the energy that's here, that's the universe telling me, great job. We've got your back and there's more to come. So good. So good. You have this you have this beautiful glow about you. And, you know, the, the beauty is that there's this is going on YouTube so people can see this glow. So if you're listening in on an audio version and you want to go check out Susan's Susan's beautiful light, I really, really recommend that you do that. But you have this beautiful radiance around you. And there's, you know, it's not just the, the beautiful background that you have, but it's it's you just exude this gorgeous light that is very, very addictive, I find. And I can tell that just being in your presence is something that is almost a gift for anybody who is around you. And it's it's a very rare thing to see. And I, I think it also comes from just this this faith that you have in the universe, this this sense of surrender to everything that is, the way that you're speaking, the language that you're using around, this was my greatest guru, this was my greatest teacher, this was my best lesson, I'm so happy all these things happened to me, that I know does not happen overnight as you shared, and it's a constant work in progress. And you know, just like brushing our teeth or just like vacuuming the house, maintaining mindset and maintaining that connection with self is something that we have to do every single day. But what did it take for you, Susan? I know I, I kind of asked that in, in a previous question, but what did, what did it take for you to just find that place of surrender? How did you get, get that place of faith, just that this knowing that everything that is happening around you is happening for you and not to you? It was multiple surrenders. Mm -hmm. It was multiple hard knocks and miracles that followed. I mean, case in point, I wasn't making enough money in my first job in New York City working at ICM, a large global talent agency. So I started personal training on the side. And Barbara Walters, who I watched on my belly, on my beanbag chair in my basement, became my client. Oh, wow. Okay. And yeah. And um, I knocked on her door one day at 7 a.m. for our session. She took one look at me and she said, get in here, Susan. What is going on? And she got it out of me. I was being sexually harassed in the workplace. And she said, I'm coming with you this morning and we're confronting this man. So it was like experiences like this over and over, like difficult learning lessons, but always a miracle if I just held on long enough for that miracle to engage in it. And that's how I've done what I've done and walked through and I'm standing upright and I believe in myself and I believe in you and I believe in the people that are listening. Mm -hmm. So good. So good. You know, I was just hearing the other day around how those are the most, those who are the most successful in life are those who have gone through the most challenging experiences and decided not to succumb to them as the victim. And so seeing that all of that had to have happened for you to be where you are today, for you to use that almost as your superpower. And what's always really intriguing to me is the meaning that we give certain situations and you chose to assign a very different meaning than what you just shared earlier. And many people, I hope listening, can realize that it's not an easy journey. It's something that takes work, but it will start with a decision and it'll start with a decision that you no longer accept to live this way or accept for other people to continue to take your power even though they've done things to you that was not your fault, that was not your choice, was not anything you ever wanted to happen, you still continue to give them your power by leaving yourself in that space of, of victimhood. And so I know for, for me, there's many traumatic things I'd gone through in my life, but I never, I never wanted to give in to what happened and make that who I am. I always felt that I had that that choice. I can choose to be whoever I want to be. I can choose to give whatever meaning I want to that particular situation. And I can do it right now. I can make that change right now. And it really just starts with that decision that I no longer allow myself to live one more single moment 
under this mindset with this influence from people who are not even that important to me. And so what do you think about that, Susan? Is there is there anything else you want to add to that or or maybe expand on it? Well, it's just beautiful. I feel like I found a kindred spirit, you know, <laughs> unexpectedly in this conversation. And I'm so grateful. And people that are working with you are so fortunate because that's the other piece. I couldn't do this alone. Mm -hmm. I had the support of others, whether they were professionals or friends or just strangers who I happened to meet mm -hmm. and they passed along a few words, but we don't get through this trajectory alone. And we have a whole support team that we may not even see right. that's helping us walk this walk. We're so blessed, no pun intended, with the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we are. And a big part of that work is also just learning to be vulnerable. And I think that's where a lot of us struggle. You know, it took me a long time to share some of the things that were truly going on in my life. And once I was able to get into that place of vulner vulnerability and realizing it's actually a strength, not a weakness. This is actually something hard to do and to say, hey, this is really what's what's going on or this is really what happened to me. And to share that, that starts that trajectory of healing. But keeping it to ourselves or feeling like we should go about it on our own, like you were sharing earlier, or that there's nobody who'll understand me, or I'm too embarrassed to share, or I don't want to be judged and I don't want to share this part of me. I think that keeps us exactly where we are. And there's no way that we can receive the help and support that we need. And sometimes that that help is really just being connected with like-minded people, connected with people who get me, who will listen, who will listen without judgment, who I can truly express and share with. And so it's interesting because I, you know, I've been doing this for for a long time, and I always, I always knew that that block, that block for people was was not, was not their their physical body. It was not the diet. It was not any of that thing. It's it's all these things. And I feel like for you, finding also um, an endurance sport is is maybe something that was a part of your healing journey. And I'm super curious to hear more about. Um, you as an athlete and, and what you do. I think you're an endurance athlete. I heard the word triathlon. Um, so maybe share a little bit. What, what do you do in terms of sports and fitness? And how do you perceive that part of you? And how has that helped and impacted your journey? Well, that's also been another false persona that fell unwillingly. Mm -hmm. So I was fiercely competitive growing up and I just carried that into adulthood and channeled it through long distance sport, multiple marathons, triathloning. And then finally I had so many injuries. I focused on master swimming mm. and I, it took four years, but I trained with a former Olympian and a world champion. And I became a nationally ranked um, master swimmer within four years. And I was really thrilled with that accomplishment, but ultimately Sherry, I couldn't walk around my block. Mm. I had a serious hip impingement. And so it's been an odyssey to recover from that. And it took all that mask away of my achievements with my athleticism and my athletics. And it was truly humbling, but I cannot tell you the beauty that it's led me to like the choice of, wow, I don't have to go out and walk in 16 below weather, if I don't feel up to it, or I don't have to go jump in the pool when it's right. 38 on deck and 76 in the water and turn blue. I can just do simple yoga, some stretching. I don't know, maybe some physical therapy exercises, a walk with my dog. And guess what? I'm not a blimp. <laughs> right. Yeah. Intuitive movement. It sounds like I love this. Wow, so amazing. And so do you do you still continue to do any endurance sports? Where are you at now with your with your fitness? So I can hike, but even swimming is not comfortable. I can't can't really rotate fully and when you swim, you really need the rotation. So I've had to surrender all of that, but I don't surrender what I learned through it. 
right. which is tenacity and focus. Mm -hmm. But now I'm getting the self-care angle mm -hmm. in spades because I took that to an extreme. I have that addictive personality. I've been clean and sober for decades, mm -hmm. but it's still in there. And I was doing it through athletics mm -hmm. and the universe said, Hey, you've got to take a look at this. Got to take a look. Right. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that you just mentioned that. That was actually my follow-up question to you was it was endurance for you an addiction was was swimming an addiction and it's it's interesting that you brought that up and so it seems that you you've also had that struggle with addictions uh in your past and can you expand on that a little bit yeah so my first red flag i took a slug from a wine jug to ask for a raise and i was like something's wrong with this picture but i thought i got happy when i drank i didn't understand it would have any kind of impact on anything and it took a professional to show me that I was addicted and that there was addiction in my family clearly. Mm -hmm. And then I just transferred it. It went into food for a bit, mm -hmm. but then I said, this is not the most loving thing. And I woke up with too many food hangovers. Mm -hmm. And so that eased up just by saying, this is not the most loving thing I can do. But then I was still equating how much I could eat with my exercise right. regime. So that had to fall away. And then I had to see that I was using endurance sport like an addict would use heroin practically mm -hmm. just to numb the sensation. Mm -hmm. And then I had to understand it's okay to have sensation. It's okay to feel fear and panic and self-loathing and jealousy. It's okay to feel rage. Right. It's all part of being human. So I had to surrender to my humanity. And that's when I really started living fully. Mm -hmm. mm. So good. So good. And, and you know, we're, we're living in the society where it's all about instant gratification and seeking pleasure. And, you know, you start a job, you don't like it, quit right away, right? Don't make it uncomfortable until it becomes better for you. Or training, for example, you start working out, it's uncomfortable. And we don't necessarily wait until we get the results. We're actually looking for that magic pill or we're looking for that perfect diet or whatever that's going to give us instant results. And so it's super interesting because when we look at addiction, that's actually what we're doing too. We're seeking an immediate source of pleasure to numb a particular feeling that or emotion that we are very uncomfortable to sit in. And we're told it's not okay to be sad, especially if we've been raised in a way where when we would cry, we were told to suck it up right be tough don't cry or if you fall and you scrape your knee what are you crying for and so we've learned that it's not okay to sit in that discomfort it's not okay to be in that negative emotion we need to immediately find a way to get out of it or ignore it completely and so i find whether it is an addiction to alcohol to drugs to food to sex to shopping to gambling whatever it is it all it all is stemming from that place of not being okay with being bored, not being okay with being uncomfortable with that negative emotion or that that sadness that we're experiencing. And it's so interesting that you you put it as well in that way. And so, so I know something that you help people do is is overcome that struggle with addiction. And so what was it for you that was the healing drive for you to overcome your addictions? I knew that I couldn't keep walking and playing it out the way that I was. Yeah. that I was going to melt and I had enough self-respect and care and belief mm. in myself. And I also felt like, you know what, you get through this, you're going to be able to help somebody else that's suffering just like you. Wow. So beyond yourself. I love this. Susan, you, you are a beautiful light and I hope you continue to do what you're doing and I'm going to definitely check out your book and I definitely want to learn more from you. I love your mindset. I just, I love your perspective on life and it's definitely, definitely something I want to be around more of. And so do you have any final words of advice or anything else you want to share with the audience before we cut our discussion today? Well, it's, it's shameless self-promotion, but yeah. I didn't write the book just to share my story. I wrote it so the reader would have experience. And the appendix is 
um, filled with tools, like specific exercises that I did, that I've used, and I still use. And it's really helping people. Like I thought it was just going to be a throwaway, Sherry, but it's really helping people transform and they're really lighting up around it. So yeah, that's it. So beautiful. Thank you so much for your time today. And if somebody wanted to reach out to you or maybe even pick up your book, where could they go to do that? Yeah, it's simple. Just go to Susan Gold dot us and it's all there susan gold dot us and if you're brave enough and you want to have a conversation i'd love for you to be in touch with me i'd love to hear your story so there's a place for you to do that too amazing thank you so much susan please keep doing what you're doing and sherry you too you're such a gift you're so clear and you're wise way beyond your years <laughs> received